Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today we are going to be talking about heart failure. So before I begin, um, I do recommend that you guys watch my other video on heart failure before you watch this video. The reason why is because the other video that I did, I went over how the the heart works in a sense. We go over like circulation and pathophysiology and stuff like that. So I do recommend you watching that because in order to understand today's lecture, you do need to know the basics um, of the heart failure and the heart in general and the circulation and pathophysiology of the cardio cardiovascular system. So I'll try to link that video um, somewhere here. I'm still trying to get used to this YouTube thing. Um, but if you if I can't link it, just go into um, all my videos and then just check out the one that says heart failure. Um, and then before we begin, thank you for those that um, are back to my channel. For those that are new, my name is Gabby. I'm an ER nurse that loves to teach. And yeah, let's begin. So like I said, we're going to be talking about heart failure. I wanted to talk about what is heart failure prior to starting. And it's basically the inability of the heart to provide tissue and other major organs with an adequate amount of oxygen in the blood. And like I mentioned before, if you watch the previous video that I made about heart failure, you'll understand um, this, this inability because of the way that our body circulates blood. So like I said, please, please, please um, watch that video prior to continuing this, um, this video. So what causes heart failure? So anything that has or causes damage or weakens the heart can cause heart failure. So if a patient has CAD, if they have a heart attack, if they have um, high blood pressure, that can eventually lead to the heart failing because remember, just think about when you go to the gym, okay? You're doing cardio, you're doing weights or whatever, eventually... Regardless of how much exercise you do, eventually you're going to get tired, right? You're going to be like, okay, that's it. Time to go home. So think about your heart this way. Yeah, your heart at the beginning will be like, oh, wow, there's something going on in, in the body. Let me work harder so I could pump the sufficient amount of blood that um, the heart that the body needs to, you know, sustain life, right? But eventually the heart is going to get tired. It's going to be working and working and working and working. And then it's literally going to give out. So this is what happens when a patient starts to have heart failure. These things come into play. They're chronic things that occur in the body. And eventually, the heart starts to fail and get weak. So apart from that, also endocarditis, which is damage, um, damage to the heart valves, cardiomyopathy and myocarditis, congenital heart defects, and um, dysrhythmias and arrhythmias could all cause heart failure. So... The risk factors, there's things that we could prevent or fix prior to leading to those causes and then ending up with heart failure. So high blood pressure and CAD, you know, we could do a lot of things to prevent high blood pressure. And if they, if you can't prevent it and you already have it, then managing it. Um, same thing with CAD, obesity. Obesity plays along uh, like a big factor. And when we start talking about cardiovascular systems, you're going to see that obesity comes up to be like one of like the most talked about risk factors. It pops up in every single disease. Um, so does alcohol and smoking. So those two risk factors are very, very common in a lot of diseases. Um, sleep apnea could also cause this because when a patient has sleep apnea, they're not um, breathing in the amount of oxygen that um, that they need um, and then eventually that's going to make the, the heart and the lungs and everything work um, work more and then like we mentioned heart defects um, if there's defects out are unable to be fixed eventually the heart is going to get tired weak and cause heart failure now the biggest thing for your exams when you are going over heart failure is knowing the difference between left-sided and right-sided heart failure. Okay, this is something that is asked um, in your exams frequently. You're going to have multiple, multiple exams. You're going to see this on the NCLEX. And not only for exam purposes, when you guys work in the, in the hospital, 
your patients are going to present with these symptoms and just looking at them, you're going to know what type of heart failure they have. Um, so it's very, very important for you guys to remember and to understand um, what's going on. And like I said, the previous video that I did about the heart, it kind of goes into more depth about why um, left-sided and right-sided uh, heart failure occurs and why you see those specific things, okay? So please, 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 like I said, just watch that video because I'm telling you it's going to make life so much easier for you. So another thing that you might get asked on the exam is that usually patients with right-sided heart failure already have left-sided heart failure because left-sided heart failure is mostly the cause for right-sided. Not saying that someone could only have right-sided heart failure, but the majority of the time, the left-sided heart failure causes the right-sided heart failure. I remember it was one of my questions on my exams when I took med surge, so it's something that you want to keep in mind as well. Um, so let's talk about the left-sided. So the left-sided heart failure is going to basically give you symptoms associated with the lungs. So something that you could remember is left starts with an L, lung starts with an L. So the left-sided heart failure causes symptoms in your lungs, okay? So you're going to see the patient short of breath with dyspnea, tachypnea, cough, crackles, cyanosis, um, low oxygen levels and when a, and a person has low oxygen levels they start to get acidotic and that's going to lead to the patient getting restlessness and confusion and then they are also going to have uh, elevated PAWP um, if you're not in um, cr um, critical care med search I don't think that you'll need to know that um, but just in case write that down um, what was I going to say? Okay, so usually when we have patients with heart failure and um, they come in with like restless, restlessness, confusion, low oxygen levels, we usually do an ABG. Um, this is an arterial blood gas. The reason why we do that is because we check the oxygen level in the artery. This is going to signalize us like how much oxygen they are actually perfusing to the body. Because remember, when we do an IV on a person, the blood that we're getting from there is from the venous um, system. So that blood has already circulated in the body and delivered the oxygen where it has to be. And now it's returning to the heart to obtain the oxygen. So you're not going to get an accurate reading of oxygen levels from the venous system. So that's why we do an ABG. Okay, just keep that in mind. Might be asked on your exam. So an arterial blood gas. That is something that we do to check oxygen levels. And then depending on that, um, we'll see if the patient is acidotic. So that's when like the pH comes in, into play. Your PO2, um, your CO2, um, your bicarb, things like that. Um, you don't have to go into depth in that, but... Um, just know that obviously that's how we check for uh, oxygen levels for these patients, okay? So as you can see, left-sided heart failure has to do a lot with the lungs, okay? Because the, the, the blood is backtracking or backflowing into the lungs, okay? Now for right-sided heart failure, the blood is, uh, is backflowing towards the body, right? So you're going to see everything... So the the symptoms are going to be everything except the, um, the lungs, right? Because you'll see the symptoms for the lungs with the left-sided heart failure. The right-sided heart failure is like the rest of the body. So right starts with R, rest of the body, R, okay? So think about that. Rest of the body has to do with right-sided heart failure. So you're going to see this patient with dependent edema, um, ascites, enlarged liver and spleen, uh, JVD, increased weight, increased peripheral venous pressure. So um, I do want to keep, I, I want you to keep in mind as well that the patient is not going to have, or they might have multiple symptoms like this, but they're not going to have like this whole entire list, okay? Just because they have like dependent edema, their, their liver and spleen don't necessarily have to be enlarged to be diagnosed with right-sided heart failure, okay? Um, and then the previous video that we talked about, um, about like the heart and stuff, we went over like the pro BMP and things like that. So those are like other laboratory, um, exams that we'll go over, 
um, or we'll do on on patients to determine if they have heart failure. Okay. Um, what else? And let me see the JVD. So you might get a, a question on the exam and um, it'll be like a case study and it'll tell you um, that you want to check for JVD. How do you do this? So basically the answer will be that you as a nurse will tell the patient to turn their hair, um, turn their head to the side and like that you assess the jugular vein, okay? JVD means jugular vein distension. So if you see a bulging uh, vein on this patient's neck, that means that they have JVD because the blood is pulling and, and um, basically black back flowing from the right side of the heart towards the body, okay? Now, for treatment and care, it depends on how bad the patient is. So usually for medications, we kind of start the patient on either ACEs or ARBs or beta blockers. The reason why is because these decrease the pressure on the heart, okay? Diuretics are very, very common um, with this uh, diagnosis because like we talked about, Regardless if it's left or right-sided heart failure, there's going to be fluid buildup. Regardless if it's in the lungs or in the body, diuretics are going to release that fluid buildup. Just keep in mind that you know that there is diuretics like furosemide and bumetanide that you give it and it releases potassium. And then you have your potassium sparing, which is your spironolactone that, um, that it's going to... Um, make keep the potassium okay so um usually those are are asked in like a uh, pharmacy class but sometimes med search professors like to give you like a case study that you have a patient with hyper um with hypo um hypokalemia but you have to give diuretics which diuretic will you give usually it's spironolactone okay and then digoxin digoxin is very very important to know because this increases um the strength of contraction okay just make sure that you know that there could be digoxin toxicity. Look up in your books um, the digoxin levels. Um, I don't know it from the top of my head, um, but you do need to know um, the, the digoxin levels um, for your exams. Excuse me. Um, what else can I tell you? Um, I'm not sure if your professor will ask you but like if you're in med search like going over like critical care a lot of these patients that are like end stage heart failure you'll see them like on a milronone drip um and this could help you also with like when you guys become uh, nurses especially if you're going to work in the er if you see a patient with like a milronone drip you already know that that patient is automatically like end stage heart failure and these patients need to survive with that medication okay and that medication kind of does the same thing as digoxin but it's more more um i believe it's like more potent and what it does is basically it contract it helps contract like the contraction of the heart as well because of their heart being so weak okay so like i said depending on heart failure or what the, or, or how severe the heart failure and what caused the heart failure for this specific patient surgeries um might be a recommendation so if they have like a valve um problem they could have a valve replacement they could have a cabbage which is rerouting the pumping circulation um sometimes when they have blocks uh you could uh see a patient getting either a defibrillator or like a ventricular assist device um, and then sometimes uh, patients will need a heart transplant, especially those patients with like specific heart defects. They most likely will need a heart transplant. And then lastly, your nursing interventions. So as a nurse, you obviously want to, um, you know, uh, auscultate your lungs, uh, making sure that the patient doesn't have like any um, crackles or wheezing. And then you're obviously going to provide oxygen if needed for the patient. Now, I do want to keep, um, I want to kind of specify because this is something that's not talked about in nursing school. And when you go on the field, you're going to be like, what the hell is going on? So a lot of these patients, you're going to connect them to the monitor. And like I said, and I have said previously, please, please, please don't be that nurse that, that looks at the monitor and starts freaking out. Okay. Treat your patient always. Do not treat your monitor. 
okay? If you, if you put your patient on the monitor and the oxygen is saying that they're 98, 100, but you're seeing that this patient is literally gasping for air, using their accessory muscles, using their abdominal muscles, you need to put this patient on oxygen. You need to put them. Either one, the pulse ox is not reading correctly. Two, maybe their oxygenation is still okay in the circulation, but they're still gasping for air and you're not going to have them in distress for no reason. Or you have to do the ABG, like I said, because remember the monitor is looking at the, at the, like the, it's like with a little light. So it's not accurate. So sometimes we need an ABG to make sure that that oxygen reading is correct. And the majority of the time it's not. So just make sure that you're treating your patients and looking out for symptoms of respiratory distress, like accessory muscles um, use, abdom abdominal muscles use, tripod position. Um, what else do I see? Uh, cyanosis, um, nasal flaring, pursed lip breathing. You know, there's like a lot of things as a nurse, you kind of have to be very like vigilant about things that you need to learn how to assess your patient and not look at the monitor. And it goes away, it goes as well, like if the patient is connected to the monitor and it says that their oxygen level is 40, but you're seeing that the patient is normal, just like you and me breathing fine, obviously that's not a normal reading, okay? So please, please, please do not be that nurse um, because it's seen in the, in the field a lot and um, I know that it's not educated in nursing school and it's not, it's not anyone's fault, especially like as a new nurse, but it's something that you want to keep in mind um, going forward, okay? Um, also, for fluid volume, you want to make sure that you have fluid restriction on these patients. You're doing your INOs, um, especially um, every time that you give diuretics or you have a patient with heart failure, check your INOs, especially when you're giving fluids. Like if you have a patient with like... Um, whatever it is, pneumonia, sepsis, or whatever, if you're giving bags of fluids, you want to make sure that those bags of fluids are, you know, um, getting excreted by the patient, because if not, then you're the one putting that patient into fluid overload. Um, so every time that you put, give a diuretic, or you have fluid restrictions, things like that, um, do your INOs, okay? Also, uh, you have to educate your patient that they have to be on a low sodium diet. And then this is very important and something asked on your exams is your daily weights. Um, it will be asked on your exam when you have to call your doctor when you're doing a daily weight. So you'll get a scenario that the patient is admitted for heart failure and that you're doing your daily weight and the patient's weight went from 150 pounds to 155 pounds in one day in within 24 hours what would be your next intervention in this case your answer is to call the doctor okay because that m amount of weight more than two to three pounds gain weight in one day is not okay it's not normal this means and it's indicating that the patient is um, restricting more fluids okay and then just make sure that you also educate your patient on like the medications and lifestyle changes that they have to um to do. And that's pretty much it for our lecture. If you guys have any questions, like always, you could always comment below here on YouTube or you guys could contact me on Instagram at nursegabby dot underscore. And that's pretty much it. If you guys have any recommendations on what um topic you guys want me to do next i would love for you guys to comment that below or contact me on instagram as well um i usually just do whatever videos um that come in mind but if you guys have specific topics that you guys want me to go over or an exam that's coming and you need me to go over it feel free to always give me suggestions and ask me i will always be here to help you guys and good luck on your next exam